Giotti here. Welcome to the Italy, the land of wine, wine class. And I am not going to waste any time. We're just going to get straight into it right now. So in the ancient world, the Italian peninsula was known as the land of wine. Um, it was called Enotria in Italian. People traveled all over the Mediterranean uh, by boat, by foot, um, uh, by horse to taste the riches of the land. Pliny the Elder, a Roman author and naturalist, wrote about the abundance of wine grapes all over the peninsula. He wrote a book called Historia Naturalis, or Natural History. But today, Italy is more known for its food than its wine. Let me prove it to you. Is Cabernet Sauvignon a grape or a wine? It's a trick question. The answer is both. Cabernet Sauvignon is the name of the red grape that turns into Cabernet Sauvignon wine. The grape comes from France, so we call it a native grape of France. This is by far the most famous wine in the world today. And that's because places from Chile to Australia to California make Cabernet. Everybody makes Cabernet, basically. Even the Italians do. How about Pinot Noir? Have you ever heard of Pinot Noir? Uh, guess where that came from? France. Pinot Noir grapes turn into Pinot Noir wine. Then you've got Sauvignon Blanc. You've got Merlot, Chardonnay. These are all native French grapes, and they also happen to be the most popular wines today. And interesting, interestingly enough, none of those grapes are Italian. What about Pinot Grigio? That's a famous Italian white wine, right? Well, actually, that's a French grape, too. It's called Pinot Gris. So if Italy was the land of wine in the ancient world, why are none of the world's most popular wines Italian today, like truly Italian? So you might say, Tony, hold on a second. What about Chianti? That's Italian. It's true. Chianti is very Italian. It's 100% Italian. But my question is, does one wine make Italy deserving of being called the land of wine? After all, Malbec is the most popular wine from Argentina. Most people have heard of Malbec, right? Why don't we just call Argentina the land of wine? But nobody calls Argentina the land of wine. And by the way, Malbec is a native French grape that they grow in Argentina, and it became their most popular wine. So in the end, why don't we just call France the land of wine? They obviously have many, many great wines. In fact, most of the world's most collectible wines are French. But France was never called the land of wine either. So why was Italy called the land of wine 2,000 years ago? I mean, that's a big statement to call it that. And now, how come it's known as the place that makes Chianti and a few lesser known wines? And on top of it all, it was the Greeks that called the Italian peninsula the land of wine. They were the most advanced winemakers of the time, and they never said, they never ever said that Greece was the land of wine. They said the Italian peninsula was the land of wine. They called it that for some good reason. So if Italy is the land of wine, then the best wines in the world should be Italian wines, right? At least logically so. That's not necessarily the case today. So let me share with you what happened uh, to Italy. So when you go back to the 1860s, there was a bug called the phylloxera. It was an insect, and it basically infested all the vineyards in Europe. It devastated all the Italian vineyards, wiped out. So wine production went down to almost zero. They were still making wine in places that were not affected, but we're talking a very small percentage. Uh, poverty has uh, basically been a part of Italy since the end of the Renaissance. Um, and it led eventually, at the end of the 1800s, 
to the first massive, massive Italian immigration where uh, they predominantly went to the United States, they went to Australia, they went to South America. We're talking about millions and millions of Italians that left Italy uh, because they didn't have the money to even buy their own land. So then uh, Mussolini came into power and he was in power for a couple of decades. He didn't allow Italians to leave at all during that period. Once he was assassinated, there was a second mass, mass emigration out of Italy. And it continued on until the 60s and 70s. Uh, my father came over in 1972, which was the end of that mass migration. Italy was very poor. In fact, uh, my father's village was very, very poor. And Italy, uh, once again, started to replant and make wine again. And so uh, since Italian wine has always been part of their culture uh, for thousands of years, they were extremely excited um, to be able to have wine again. And the solution, the, the way they were able to make wine again was actually the French uh, discovered that if you planted uh, American rootstock and grafted the native French vines and native Italian vines onto the American rootstock, um, you were able to make, uh, you were able to grow the vines again and the grapes again without this phylloxera in insect infestation. Uh, American rootstock was the, was the cure. Um, the phylloxera insect does not like American rootstock. So that's how the Italians were able to make wine again. And they were so thrilled about being able to make wine again they made a lot of wine, a lot of wine. Do you see this picture down in the bottom right-hand corner? Um, this is what made Italian wine very, very famous uh, in the United States from the 1960s through the 70s and 80s. There was a lot of big gallon jugs of what we call table wine, which is nothing more than uh, bulk juice. Um, not the highest quality grapes, but uh, typically it was uh, very drinkable. My grandfather, when he came from Italy to the United States, um, he was he was not able he was not able to um, uh, make his own wine. He bought grapes, but the grapes were of such a poor quality. So he was buying the Carlo Rossi brand from uh, from California in this in this big jug, which actually which is funny because it was uh, not even an Italian wine. So. Here we go, fast forward. Now, Italy has had a couple centuries of bad luck, and uh, the French were able to get out of this phylox phylloxera epidemic much faster than the Italians did. Um, and so, here's a picture of Italy. This is a picture of the boot um, with Sicily down here at the bottom. And basically, during the Industrial Revolution, early 1900s, uh, we, we started to see an industrial north, uh, lots of factories, lots of manufacturing plants coming out. And then the south remained a strictly agricultural uh, economy. And that is sort of still true today. What's interesting is that the most famous Italian wines, the most respected Italian wines, whether you're talking about a, uh, a $15 Chianti or a $100 Barolo, typically are coming from the, the industrial north, which is sort of interesting. They were uh, way ahead in terms of technology and revamping the, uh, the wine industry. But it was actually the south um, from, from about Rome down to Sicily, which is the territory that the Greeks called Enotria, or uh, the land of wine, interestingly enough. But there is some light at the end of the tunnel. Um, Italy today is in the middle of a wine renaissance, a total rebirth of winemaking, in fact, uh, fine winemaking. And what they are doing today is they are restoring, replanting the ancient vines of Enotria. And we call those native Italian grapes. I had just mentioned several native French grapes like Cabernet, Merlot, and Pinot Noir, 
which the rest of the world has adopted and planted them, um, that's in part because they're easy to plant and grow. Whereas native Italian grapes, uh, which are an estimated 2,000 of them, um, predominantly grow and flourish only on the Italian peninsula. And these are very, very uh, special wines, distinct flavors. Um, there's this relationship between the grape, the soil, and the climate. Uh, so there's this geological um, slash climate relationship that goes on with the grape that produces a unique flavor. And every little region in Italy and every little sub-region in Italy has their own local native grapes that they use and is really sort of characterized uh, the local people uh, who grow them and make wine with them. And of course, there's a long, long history. Some of uh, Italy's oldest varietals can be traced back 3,000 years, whereas the Cabernet Sauvignon grape is only about 500 years old coming out of France. So the Italian Peninsula um, is one of the oldest wine cultures uh, in the history of wine. So let me just show you a quick map here. Um, this is a map of all the wine producing regions of the world. You'll notice uh, some green looking countries here, the green highlighted countries. These are what we call the New World wines. Uh, basically these wines, these uh, wine producing countries never really had wine uh, beyond say 200 years ago. When you look at the orange area in the Mediterranean here, this is what we call old world wines. And this is sort of where wine originated from and sort of naturally flourished there. And um, I personally only drink old world wines. Um, I, just, uh, I just find them to be more complex and more interesting and fascinating to drink. But back to the native grape varietals, um, there's, a estimate, there's an estimated 8,000 different grape varietals, unique grape varietals used just for winemaking. We're not talking about table grapes, which are much larger. Wine grapes are much smaller um, and produce um, complex flavors and aromas and textures. In Italy, there's an estimated 2,000 different grape varietals. So that's one fourth of all the world's wine grapes happen just in this little um, south central part of Europe on the Italian peninsula. That's more than France, Greece, and Spain combined, which are the second, third, and fourth place in terms of native grape varietals. So, you know, there's, you know, Italy is just basically located on the perfect place on planet Earth for. Um, for producing native wine grapes. And, you know, again, these are treasures. Um, we want to support small Italian producers that are growing them um, because it's just, it's just like, imagine, let's just say uh, you like apples and one day you were to find out that, let's just say Fuji apples are your favorite type of apple. Imagine that one day on the news it breaks that, uh, Fuji apples are extinct and they no longer exist. Or go even a step further, just say that you know apples have gone extinct. Um, you would probably be very disappointed, I'd imagine, right? If apples were to go extinct and you loved eating apples. So that's sort of the same thing with these various uh, grape varietals. Some are extremely rare, while others are very prolific. prolific. So um, just a little bit about me real quick. Uh, my name is Tony Margiata. I'm a first-generation Italian-American. My father comes from a small village in southern Italy called Montaquila. Uh, there's only about a thousand people living in that town uh, today. And um, as you can see here, this is an aerial view of my father's town, uh, Montaquila. Um, I spent uh, the last 20 years going there in the summers, staying with my aunt and uncle and sitting in her kitchen and basically learning how to speak Italian uh, in the kitchen while she was cooking. And during those years, I traveled from the top of the boot down to the bottom of the boot. I fell in love with the food and the wines. I began visiting vineyards. I began developing a really uh, fascination with 
with wine, especially these native Italian grapes. And I, I just finally realized that my purpose in life was to um, uh, find these local wines and bring them back uh, to the United States for people to enjoy. And in the interim, I've won many awards for my wine discoveries, double gold medals, and silver medal at uh, the New York International Wine Competition. I've written a book about Italian wines uh, called Hidden Gems of Italy. It won Best European Wine Book in the U.S. You can get it on Amazon. And let's get into the nitty gritty here now. Um, you know, since this is just a wine class um, during the, the COVID pandemic, uh, unfortunately I don't have any wines um, for us to taste together, but I just wanted to give you a little sense of what it would be like to take a, a wine class uh, without the wines, of course. Um, but I, I can help you out with that later um, in the class. But today, we're going to take a look at three different regions in Italy. As you can see, all these different colors represent all the 20 regions in Italy. You can think of them as 20 different states. And every single region has their own unique native grape varietals. You're never going to learn them all. I'm never going to learn them all, but it's a lot of fun tasting and trying and and exploring Italian wines. Um, I know that the rest of my life I'm going to be exploring Italian wines and I still won't know them all, but I just love, love, love um, tasting the unique flavors, textures, and aromas of different wine grapes from Italy. Um, but today we'll, we'll go over a few wines coming from the island of Sardinia, uh, the island of Sicily, and also this region over here called Campania, which is where you find the uh, metropolis of Naples and the Amalfi Coast is right here. So let's continue. I also wanted to show you this uh, pair of pictures here. Um, the code word for quality, I call it. Here's a little secret about, about wines in general, not just Italian wines. Um, unfortunately, over 90% of all the wines in your local wine shops, probably closer to 95 to 97% of all the wines in your local wine shops are made from what we call mass-produced wines. And, you know, all these wine brands, when you walk into the stores and you look at these bottles, they'd have you believe that Grandpa is in the vineyard picking those grapes and making those wines. Nothing could be further from the truth. The truth is there are machines, as you can see in this picture on the right, uh, that are harvesting the grapes by machine. And what they're doing is they are picking all the grapes. They're harvesting the unripe grapes with the mature grapes. They're picking rotten grapes, uh, bacteria-infected grapes, uh, low-quality grapes, and some high-quality grapes, I'd imagine, and then bringing it back to the wine cellar and mixing them together, blending them together, and adding chemicals, additives, uh, to make the wine drinkable. Um, you can produce millions of bottles a year uh, with this technique. So this is truly the industrialization of winemaking right here and just about every single bottle in your local wine shop is probably coming from something similar to that picture. Um, and then on the left hand side here we have an individual hand harvesting, hand selecting in the, in the best uh, situations um, with small artisanal winemakers, they are hand selecting the best grapes only from their vineyard and making wine with that so that when you start with uh, uh, high quality grapes, you'll end with uh, the process with a, with a fine wine. Uh, the flip side to this is that you can't make a lot of wine when you're hand selecting, hand harvesting the grapes. Um, you're looking at an average of 50,000 bottles a year just to give you perspective um, between the two types of producers. Now, um, ideally, I, I prefer to drink these wines coming from these vineyards here, small vineyards, hand selecting uh, the grapes and all the wines in the Gladiator portfolio, which is uh, my importing company, 
all of our wines are coming from small vineyards where they are hand picking, hand selecting only native Italian grapes. Um, you know, again, you can't make a lot of wine this way, but the wine is phenomenal. And the dirty little secret, which I'll show you later, is uh, the wines are cleaner than the mass produced wines. So if you really want to drink high quality wines, the secret is not how much you spend, but whose wine are you drinking? Okay, um, let's continue. I just want to show you a picture of another vineyard here. As you can see, no tractor could possibly get in here um, to do any harvesting. Look at this one. As beautiful as this landscape is, notice how wide the rows are. This allows the tractors to just mow the place down and pick its grapes. Um, this is a mass producer easily. Um, and then here's another picture of a tractor spraying chemicals. This is another no-no. This is a pet peeve of mine. Um, I don't drink any wines that have herbicides or pesticides in them. Um, unfortunately, the certified organic wines um, don't necessarily protect you from that. Uh, I'll get into that a little bit more in a bit, but this is what I'm looking for. These are the types of wines that, you know, that I want to taste hand picked, hand picked grapes right here. This is, this is the way. And, and honestly, as, as hard of work as it is, and it is hard work, um, as you can see, the people are very happy. It's sort of a community gathering sort of, uh, activity. They get to work under the sun. They get to work outside, fresh air, picking beautiful grapes. It's a fun thing to do. I know that the Italians uh, have like a little feast after the harvest. They're roasting a pig or roasting meats and having pasta outside after um, everyone has contributed to the harvest. Um, just want to show you a quick graph here. This is a, a graph, and I apologize that it's an Italian, but it doesn't matter. Um, these are two pictures. One is a picture of a... Uh, uh, conventional wine, mass-produced wine you find at a liquor store, and these are all the possible chemicals that could be found in that bottle of wine versus an organic wine to the right. And as you can see, there are still many, many additives that can go into the wine and sort of produce a, what I call a synthetic or fake wine. Like, for example, putting uh, wood chips into the wine uh, to make it taste woody. Um, even though the wine never actually tasted true, uh, it, it never came in contact with uh, with actual oak. So that's what you got to look out for. Um, the organic uh, wines don't necessarily guarantee cleaner wines. They're still allowed to put sulfites into the wine if need be. So if you're trying to avoid sulfites, the organic symbol doesn't necessarily guarantee that. Um, you know, uh, not to. Uh, bust your bubble here, but um, the truth of the matter is if you want to drink truly clean wine, I'd recommend looking for small producers um, to uh, to drink clean wine. That's the dirty little secret, whether they have an organic symbol or not. You're more likely to get a cleaner wine from a small artisanal producer than a mass producer that's organic certified, for example. So let's go over um, the first uh, white wine today. We're going to taste five different wines uh, today, or at least pretend we're tasting five different wines. This is uh, a, a white grape called Fiano, and Fiano has been growing in southern Italy for thousands of years. The Roman emperors knew about Fiano, and they enjoyed Fiano, and it predominantly grows in the area outside of the uh, city of Naples and the Amalfi Coast, um, and it will grow uh, just about anywhere in southern Italy, but its spiritual home, we say, is in that Campania region around Naples, near Pompeii, and also near Mount Vesuvius, this, this, uh, this region of Italy, because um, this is where the Roman emperors actually used to hang out and have their little uh, leisurely activities and vacations in the Campania region. Um, so this is Fiano. And on the left here, you can see a small vineyard called Antico Borgo. And he's a, it's a micro producer. He makes about 10,000 bottles a year of, uh, of Fiano. Um, this is the 2018 that we're looking at. And I did a pasta with, uh, with clams uh, as a pairing, which is an outstanding pairing. 
but um, Fiano Diabellino is typically medium to full bodied. Um, and when it's young, uh, you'll notice lots of lots of strong citrus tones, uh, closer to lemon than anything else. Um, nice crisp acidity, and what makes Fiano very uh, special compared to other white wines is that Fiano can age for at least 10 years, making it an age-worthy white wine. This is very rare, and you can pick up this wine for like $22, all right? So it's all hand-harvested, hand-selected native Fiano grapes for $22. You get to drink artisanal wine. It's, it's, pretty, it's pretty incredible. Um, what else can I tell you about it? I think I think that's enough. It's um it's a DOCG for those of you who know Italian wines very well. Um, Fiano di Avellino is the appellation uh, from where the uh, Avellino is a small town um, about forty five minutes from Naples. All right, let's go to the next wine. Got a picture of planet Earth here. Just wanted to break up the monotony here and we're going to go to Sicily now. Sicily is also in the middle of a native wine renaissance. This is a, a beach outside of Palermo called, um, oh geez, the name is, uh, is escaping me right now. Um, I'll let you guys know, but this is outside of Palermo about 10 minutes. This is uh, all the sub-regions in Sicily, um, at, but this orange section here, the north central area, is where we're going to go and taste our next white wine. It's from the Castel Lucimiano estate, which is found high up in the Madonie Mountains. This whole orange area is a very, very high mountaintops, and in fact, the Castel Lucci vineyards are the highest above sea level in Sicily, between 1,500 and 3,000 feet above sea level. And this white wine is made with a native Sicilian grape called Catarato. Catarato is indigenous to Sicily. It's been there for at least a thousand years. It doesn't grow on mainland Italy. It's truly, truly unique to Sicily. And uh, historically, it was made in bulk, bulk juice, and blended with other grapes and sold very cheaply. Um, no one really thought you could make a fine wine with it uh, until the Castel Lucimiano estate came along and uh, made a 100% monovarietal of Catarato uh, from the Madanio Mountains, uh, which is part of the secret sauce, the high elevation, where there's this uh, nice contrast of heat during the day, which grapes love, and also uh, cooling off at night, which the grapes love to do as well. And you just produce a, a higher quality, more aromatic, fruit forward uh, wine. Also, very, very crisp acidity. Uh, for those of you who are enophiles and you're familiar with Mount Etna wines, the Mount Etna Bianco, the white wines, um, are typically made with Catarato and Caricante. Um, but this is 100% Catarato, and it is not only the best Catarato in Sicily. It might even be one of the best white wines in Southern Italy, period. I've been drinking this wine for six years. It's, it's phenomenal. Um, they produce anywhere from 40 to 50,000 bottles a year. And again, this is only $22. Sustainable, clean agriculture. Only hand-picked grapes. Um, truly, truly special wine. All right, let's move into some reds. Uh, we're going to stay with the Castel Lucimiano uh, vineyard uh, in the Madonie Mountains of Sicily. And this is a very, very special red grape called Pericone. Now, Pericone is the ancient varietal of Sicily. It's been growing there over 2,000 years. It's the oldest grape that we still have uh, because some native grapes throughout Italy do go extinct if either they're not cultivated um, or some other climatic conditions cause it to stop. Uh, growing. So Pericone actually almost went extinct um, in the 1980s because farmers didn't believe you could make a good wine with it anymore. And with wine becoming more and more trendy and in demand, they decided in Sicily to plant more Merlot and Cabernet and, and Syrah 
uh, on the island to sort of keep up with the with the trends. So they only a, a you know a small mm, segment of the population of locals uh, continue to cultivate pericone and just sell it locally. But historically, um, this is a little secret. Pericone was made in bulk form and shipped out to France and northern Italy uh, to be blended with their fine wines. So I find it amusing that um, at some point or another, someone who was drinking a Bordeaux or a, um, a Barolo from northern Italy uh, might have had some Pericone in that wine, which is uh, sort of funny to me. Um, and they, the reason why they were buying Pericone to blend with their wines was when they had a weak vintage um, because it added color and alcohol uh, to their wine. So this is a very, very rich wine, very rich in color, um, dark red hues with a little bit of violet on the outside. Um, it's, uh, it's a truly unique wine. 10,000 bottles are made per year. Um, very, very difficult terrain to grow fine pericone grapes. Um, they actually do dry the grapes slightly. Um, it's called apacimento. It's a technique that the Romans um, uh, were famous for, drying the grapes and then squeezing the juice out of them and fermenting that juice uh, created a much richer, uh, fruitier, sweeter wine. This is a dry wine, but it's, it's, uh, it's got a lot of fruit. It's got earth. It's got spices. It's uh, very complex. And for those of you who are uh, into health and well-being, it's also loaded with anthocyanins, polyphenols, and one of the highest levels of resveratrol can also be found. So um, Pericone is a great wine for longevity, for those of you who are into health. Um, I'll just show you a, pic uh, a quick picture of, this is a Pericone cluster that I'm holding right here. Um, as you can see, it's growing in an ancient bush. So people have to, the farmers have to get on their hands and knees to cultivate this. It is not easy. And with that said, you'd, you'd imagine that uh, the price tag would be very high for this wine. And in fact, I was able to get it on the shelf in New York uh, for $26 a bottle, which is incredible because it tastes like a $50 bottle of wine, as it should taste like a $50 bottle of wine because of all the extra labor that they put into the vineyard. Uh, moving on. Uh, we're back to the Campania region outside of the city of Naples, and this is the Ayanico grape, Ayanico. Uh, Ayanico is one of Italy's ancient varietals. It's a very important varietal. Um, it's an age-worthy grape. Um, Ayanico wines can age for decades. I call this the emperor's wine because it was documented by Pliny the Elder, which I, who I named earlier in his uh, Historias Naturalis book, um, the Ayanico uh, was one of the favorite uh, grapes of the Roman emperors because of its power, because of its complexity, and its ability to age. Even the Romans uh, really appreciated wines that were able to age, just like collectors do today. Um, so it's a fascinating wine. This is from the Antico Borgo winery, the same one that makes the Fiano white wine. And... Um, this wine, I'm telling you, tastes like a $100 bottle of wine, easily a $100 bottle of wine, and it sits on the shelf for $25. Um, it's an incredible hidden gem craft wine, only 4,000 bottles a year, very, very limited uh, production. Um, but uh, this is one of my personal favorite wines. Um, it's full-bodied. Um, lots of uh, red fruits and leather and ash. You know, these grapes grow in a, in a very, very volcanic soil, which comes from the Mount Vesuvius uh, eruptions of hundreds of thousands of years. Uh, this cannot be replicated in a place like California. They could never make a wine like this. Um, it's just, it just cannot be replicated by any industrial means. Truly, truly um, a special wine. And this is a picture of the oldest Ionico vine in southern Italy. If you look over here to the left, you can see a little cluster of grapes. It's still growing, still produces Ionico grapes. This is over 260 years old. It looks like a tree. 
Um, and this is actually the uh, winemaker, the genius behind the Ionico wines and also the Fiano wines. This is Raphael Inglese, who has dedicated his entire life to growing the native grape varietals of the Campania region. Um, moving on. Oh, and one final word about the Ionico wines, especially uh, the Antico Borgo wines. Decanting is sort of a, a must. Um, I would decant uh, his Ionico wines at least two hours. Um, if I have four hours to spare, I would decant the wines and open them up and let them breathe for four hours. Uh, the wine uh, continues to get fuller um, and softer and more aromatic. So highly recommend it. Decanting does make a difference. And now we're going to go to the island of Sardinia, one of Italy's 20 regions. Sardinia is a very, very special place. Um, it's besides it being an Italian region, it's also the home of one of the most ancient uh, civilizations ever. It's called the Neurogic people. Their history goes back about 8,000 years. Uh, more on that in a little bit. We're going to go over what's called Canonau. Canonau is a red grape that's indigenous to the island of Sardinia. And if you've ever heard of that book, The Blue Zones, that came out years ago, the author, um, uh, Butner, I believe is how you pronounce his name, was on the Oprah Winfrey show and um, basically said that there are five blue zones throughout the world where the majority of the population lives to be 100 years old. And Sardinia happens to be one of those areas, as well as a, a small village in the Campania region of Italy. But in Sardinia, a large segment of the population lives to be 100. And they went to analyze uh, the local diet, other than lifestyle, low-stress lifestyle. But part of the diet was this wine called Canonau. And it turns out that Canonau is sort of an arterial cleanser. Um, and it's loaded with resveratrol. So, um, you know, according to them, if you want to clean your arteries, drink some Canonau. Um, like I said, very, very high levels of uh, resveratrol. Um, the crew territory, for those of you who are enophiles, um, is sort of unofficial, but it's in, in the province of Nuoro, which is the northeastern part of the island. You can see here um, the arrow. Uh, this is where the best Canonau wines uh, grow. This is the Ataruya Estate. Um, they only produce 6,000 bottles. This is another monster bottle that is easily worth $100. I'm not kidding. This is a $100 bottle of wine. Decant it for four hours and you will um, experience something that you've never ever tasted before. It's a phenomenal wine. And this is uh, just some more Cananal grapes growing on the vine. So to recap, we went over five native Italian grapes um, found in Italy. And, um, excuse me one second. and we tasted two white wines, Fiano, Catarato, Ayanico, Pericone, and Cananal. And this is a, a picture of the vineyard in Sardinia where the Canonau grapes come from. Um, as you can see, the mountains are on one side, and on the other side is the sea. It's a little valley, Valle di Odoene, which is called the Valley of God. And it was named that by the Neurogic people some three to 8,000 years ago, um, because uh, this valley contained the most fertile soils uh, on the island. Um, and this is the only vineyard, uh, to my knowledge, uh, that is found in this area so it's uh there's a lot of history uh, in this place and, it, and the wines are very very special here's just a, another picture of uh one of the sicilian vineyards that i work at notice how short the vines are this is called albarello this is an ancient practice this is you'll never see something like this in uh, california but this is uh, albarello this is known and has been known for thousands of years to produce higher quality grapes you can't do this with mass-produced vineyards because it's just too hard to cultivate. But the producers that I work with, um, many of them do this uh, style of vine training. Here's another picture of the Albarello vines. They look like little trees. And again, you have to get on your hands and knees to pick these grapes. 
Um, this is a picture in the springtime. As you can see, the, uh, the vines are very old as well. They look like little tree trunks. This, uh, the thicker they are, the older they are. These are 70 years old, I believe, which is very old for a vine. And it's also known that once the age gets up to around 70 years, you're looking at some really, really serious, serious wines uh, coming from vines like that. Here's another picture uh, with more green. So um, I hope you enjoyed this class. Um, I hope you got something out of it. I'd like to make you an offer if that's okay with you. Um, if you want to taste these types of wines um, and experience them, I can literally uh, deliver them straight to your door. It's called the Hidden Gems Collection. I put together 12 wines, some of which were on the list that we went over today. Um, all of them come from hand-harvested vineyards, clean farming. Only the best grapes are used for winemaking with these wines. They're all native Italian varietals. They're produced and bottled at the origin, which is another quality indicator. And as I said, the quality of these wines are equal to $100 bottles. I dare you to pick up a case of these wines and try that Canonal or try that Ionico up against a wine that actually does cost $100, like a Brunello or a Bordeaux, and tell me which one you think is better. These are very limited production wines, um, as I stated earlier. Um, you're not going to find them in your local wine shops. Um, the only way you're going to get them uh, in a collection format is through me. Um, you can go to italianwines.nyc and you can learn a little bit more about them. There's more educational material if you'd like to learn more. Um, you would imagine that a, a case like this coming from Albarello Vines and uh, farmers getting on their hands and knees to cultivate that these wines would uh, you know, be $100 each, but they're not. Um, this case um, is only going to cost you $297.51. That includes tax and that includes free shipping. All you have to do is go to italianwines.nyc and click on the order form. And you can tell me how many whites, rosés, and reds. You get 12 bottles. So if you want to tell me, Tony, I want two whites and 10 reds, I can do that. If you tell me you want all reds, I can do that. If you want three rosés and nine reds, I can do that too. Not a problem. Um, the only thing is we don't ship to the following states, and you can see them below. We cannot ship to Alabama, Arkansas, Kentucky, Mississippi, New Hampshire, North Dakota, Oklahoma, South Dakota, Tennessee, Virginia, and Utah but we can ship to over 40 states and you'll get your wines in two to three business days. They'll be coming out of New York. Um, so if you live in the New York area, you'll be getting them in about a day. If you're very far away, like California, you'll probably get them in about three business days. So craft wine delivered straight to your door for $297.51. All you have to do is go to italianwines.nyc Thank you for listening, and I hope to see you on some other videos. Ciao.